from City Need Burn. First, some supporters to thank, and thank you for listening. This episode is supported by CCW Digital, leaders responsible for operations, information technology, contact centers, customer care, service, and support are invited to register for a free CCW Digital membership. Membership includes networking with 100,000 plus qualified industry professionals, quarterly executive research reports, product matchmaking, and more. Go to ccwdigital.com to join the community. This episode is also supported by the CCW Conference and Expo. The event will empower you to test, learn, and try the next big thing in customer experience optimization. Are you interested in mining data across touch points for personalized and predictive data? Are you trying to integrate your systems to get a more complete view of the customer? Are you figuring out what innovations to invest in? Chatbots, virtual assistants, AI, VR, biometrics, to name a few? Go to callcenterweek.com to register. Head of Customer and Digital Experience, APAC and EMEA for City Need Burn joins us from Customer Experience Management Summit Asia, where she discusses covering 17 countries in Asia and Europe. She notes that she'll often talk to New York HQ in the morning and perhaps at night and everyone else in between. Neve is driven by a renewed focus on customer experience through being a more customer-focused and customer-led organization. That's the primary order of business. She's restructured the team managing the experience within the digital channels, whether it's mobile, social, or city online. And Neve is interested in innovating as she and the team just launched a chatbot, which is the first banking bot of its type in the APAC region. Welcome to CCW Digital on B2BIQ. I'm your host, Seth Adler. Download episodes on ccwdigital.com or through our app in iTunes, within the iTunes podcast app in Google Play or wherever you currently get your podcasts. Neve Byrne. Asia actually covers APAC mm-hmm. and EMEA. So mm-hmm. that covers 17 countries from North Asia to Southeast Asia and includes um, EMEA, which for us is Poland, the UK, Russia and uh, UAE, Bahrain. Oh, my so goodness. It's, geographically, it's interesting because we're um, an American company. So mm. we often talk to New York in the morning and we may have calls with them at night. And then in the in the hours in between, we can work with our counterparts in the region. So it makes for a very rich and diverse uh, working life. Certainly. Certainly. S- understanding that those are the geographies, which are almost all of them, if I was uh, right. <laughs> It's everything for city consumer outside of North America and Mexico. Got it. Okay, fair enough. So we understand the geographies, but what's the first order of business when you're waking up, you know, or when you're going to sleep or whatever, if if you ever get sleep, right? So um, I'm doing, I'm covering a a couple of different roles at the moment. Mm. So um, I started off, I joined City about uh, just under two years ago Mm -hmm. in November, just at the end of 2015. Um, And the idea really was to come to bring a renewed focus on customer experience as we move towards being a much more agile organization and a much more customer-centric, customer-led organization. Um, So that, if you like, was the primary order of business. Um, at the time when I arrived at City, there was a separate digital team. So we moved to um, restructure because if we want to be a digital first bank, mm-hmm. obviously our primary focus needs to be on absolutely managing the experience within the digital channel. So mm-hmm. that's whether it's um, on the mobile application, on Citibank Online, or our experiences on social platforms. And we've integrated with many at this stage. Um, the most recent of which was on last Thursday, we anno- announced our launch of the City Chatbot on Facebook Messenger. Mm-hmm. And that's the first of its kind, actually, in the region, particularly focused on Singapore. At the moment, we launched in Singapore. And you can um, you can go in there, three easy steps to authenticate, and you can go ahead and call up your balances. You can look at your spend. So it's the first banking bot of its type in uh, in this part of the, of the world yeah. where you can fully integrate and get your... But it's so easy to authenticate. It's like a three-step thing, yeah. and you're in with an OTP and one-time password in less than, I think, five or seven seconds. What, what has been the feedback from consumers? It's obviously front of mind and now, right, being live... 
uh, what's been the feedback? So, I mean, that's just, I just mentioned that just because we just came from that, literally. Yeah, sure. Um, but um, ju- to, just to, um, I guess, it's a beta community. So there's, mm-hmm. you know, a small user group coming on first and we've limited it and then we will roll it out fully to all of our customers within the next month or so. Mm-hmm. So, so far it's been really positive. Mm-hmm. We're seeing a lot of uptake of the people who are limited within the beta group and we're learning lots already. So that's yeah. really positive. Um, in terms of the order of business every day, I would say that um, it sort of ranges across a, um, a bulk of things, really. But I look after marketing for the region as well. Mm-hmm. So um, um, I think the focus on digital marketing now is um, something that we're very um, in tune with right across the region. And each of the countries differs in terms of its capabilities, its social uh, media platform focus, um, and then our focus in every country is slightly different. We also um, never forget the importance of building the brand, whether it's in the social channel or whether it's in um, you know tr- more traditional channels like branches or outdoor, out of home TV, and so on. So, mm-hmm. you know, city ba- brand is probably. I would say the biggest, the largest, and certainly probably the most famous consumer banking brand in the world. So with that comes a lot of um, um, brand equity and therefore brand presence needs to be managed very well, which is something I I think we do very well across the 17 countries. Which is why I found it surprising that you use the word brand building. Well, I think, you know, in some markets in Asia, for example, we are not ever going to be the primary bank because we're not necessarily a transactional bank. Um, so we're not necessarily always top of mind because we're, you know, an international bank. Mm-hmm. So in countries like China, where there are much stronger local um, banks that are embedded into the ecosystem of the country, then we are very much a, um, a smaller bank. But we're very much seen as um, integrated now into the social ecosystem with our integrations with WeChat and yeah. Alipay. So I think it really just depends on the country and every single, every single country is different. Can you, how much can you tell us about uh, WeChat and then Alipay? So um, what I can tell you is that, you know, our, our integration with Alipay runs really deep. So 70% of our customers today pay their city credit card bills through Alipay, hmm. um, which means that we've seen a big decrease in the number of people calling City Phone because obviously people are, you know, happy to do this stuff online. Um, WeChat, um, we uh, started off with a basic integration, followers and so on, as, 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 as you do, um, getting people to interact. And now the integration will run much deeper to servicing, and that will be the next stage of it. So apart from account um, inquiries and, and balances and so on, it will run deeper to actual servicing in those platforms as we progress. So with WeChat, with the chatbots, it seems like you like to do these, you know, let's take this community – Let's roll it out. Let's see what we can do with it and then go. Have you been doing that over the past two years in, in other different ways as well? Or, Yeah, I think, um, I mean, social is definitely an area of extreme focus for city. Um, I think that, you know, we, one of the big things we've been really doing as well as we've been – uh, I guess experiencing a cultural transformation, and we, we are my, myself and my team are a core part of that. We're really driving um, the business as part of the the greater um, digital team, g- driving towards an agile way of working, which means a much more customer centric approach and customer led approach to what we do. Um, and this, I guess, goes back to uh, my experience in the mobile industry, where everything it's a truly digital native company because it's all that they know, mm-hmm. and um, everything is truly. Um, customer centric. So when I worked at Orange, for example, everything that we did was focused around the customer. Everything that we built was focused around the customer. And so I think that banks have a ways to go um, in moving away from product centric design to really customer led design. And that's something that um, I feel, you know, quite strongly that we want to really bring to City. And in general, we want to make banking delightful for customers. It shouldn't be this owner's experience. It should be something that is easy. I think if you use the face, uh, the Facebook chatbot with City, you'll see that it is actually easy. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine in the future that people don't think, oh, I've got to remember all these digital credentials or my credit card number, but that they can just go in, authenticate and get their, 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 their business done. Right. If you just want to send somebody money or check your account or check, check your your trading account, you probably want that to be a fairly seamless, fast experience, and you don't necessarily want all the stress and anxiety that goes with remembering all these passwords. We're trying to remove one by one all the pain points and the barriers from banking to make everyday banking very uh, useful and delightful for customers. I love it. I love it. 
Now, you have already mentioned uh, the fact that City is a storied brand, been around for a while. If memory serves, Orange was an upstart company. Yes. And so how much uh, at the start of that upstart were, were you there? Oh, well, Orange was well established. I mean, I joined Orange in 2000 and it had already been around, I guess, uh, certainly three or four years. Okay. And had made massive inroads into into the mobile industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that what was interesting about Orange as a brand was um, a maniacal focus on the customer, um, um, an absolute desire to lift um orange out of the category of dealing with just price plans and comparing the numbers of minutes and you know you get x number of text messages if you spend 9.99 a month and what orange did was we stood back and said how do we address this from a customer perspective let's tap into people's passions let's tap into Mm. their lifestyle Mm. and it was the first brand in that category to really elevate um if you like telecoms which was a, a you know a utility out of that category and it became a truly lifestyle brand right and with that of course from a personal perspective I had an amazing job because I ended up, you know, looking after brand partnerships and we did lots of exciting stuff. Um, I then um, had the opportunity to go down to the South Pacific Mm -hmm. to open up a mobile operator down there with um, a company called Digicel, who are absolutely at the forefront of pioneering this stuff Mm -hmm. and uh, going in and uh, taking on the incumbent in the countries where they operate. And this was probably having done the Caribbean and been in Central America and having sold in Ireland to BT, uh, Digicel came to the South Pacific. I was one of the four or five people who went down there in the beginning. We built five mobile networks, no, six mobile networks in five years um, from the ground up, one or two acquired. That's the second time you've told me that, and I still don't understand how that would be possible. In all seriousness, how how did you get that much done in that, we time. acquired a couple of networks, okay. but on the whole, we built them. Mm-hmm. So um, on the whole, we actually uh, plotted where the network would be, and we brought in the towers. In some cases, we built all the stores, or we rented them where we could. In some cases, um, like in Papua New Guinea, we actually built the physical structures, the billboards, and some in Samoa as well, mm-hmm. because they didn't exist. And so we had like almost like speed dating recruitment days, So because we had to you know, fill the decks with people for our call centers and our stores. And so people would come in and they had like five minutes to um, tell us why they should come work at Digicel. And so it was an amazing experience in learning how to build a business, learning all the pain points, learning how not to do it, learning how to do it, and um, really trying to integrate into cultures very quickly because to market to these um, uh, islands and countries, you really need to understand their culture. It's mm-hmm. very, very different to anything that I had experienced in Europe. Sure. And even within Papua New Guinea itself, there are many, many, many different tribes. And to understand the complexities of how they interact with each other yeah. and trying to get under the skin in Fiji of of the country, um, it's it's really important. So we never we we never sort of we always took the approach that. Um, Each country is case by case and each customer group is case by case. So, again, a very customer-centric focused brand. Mm. You mentioned Europe. For those not in the know or who don't know you, anyone that read your name doesn't understand how it's pronounced Neve. Yes, correct. Where are you from? Um, I'm from Ireland. I so uh, in Ireland, uh, we pronounce N-I-A-M-H as almost like N-E-E-V-E. So the M-H becomes a V, and mm. so therefore you get that weird sounding name. But I can tell you, I lived in Paris for, um, you know, a few years, mm-hmm. and they used to call me uh, Niam, Nymph, all kinds of things. So oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got called all kinds of things, so I'm, I'm kind of good with it. Well, Nymph being, of course, Shakespearean, right? Let's do that. Midsummer. <laughs> Night's Dream, I think. There's yeah. a few nymphs in there. Yeah. What, you know, when you were a kid in Ireland, what were you into? What were what was exciting to you? So I was um, really, really um, into hockey. That was kind of my thing. And really? I played a lot of tennis, but hockey, field hockey, not uh-huh. ice hockey, field hockey. Uh-huh. In Ireland, we play field hockey. Yes. Um, so that was something that I spent a lot of time doing. Um, There's that other game as well, which is almost field hockey, but I the camogie and hurling. So the, hurling. the yeah, so hurling is. So my father was actually a great um, hurling player, and uh, yeah, he was a he was a goalie, but he was a small guy, but he was a goalie. Yeah. Um, so that sort of actually, some of my cousins are um, very successful camogie players and uh, play for their counties and so on. But yeah, I played a lot of hockey at a competitive level, and mm. I really loved it. Mm. Played a lot of tennis too, 
and then you have the usual uh, things that you do in Ireland which is a lot of family focused stuff traveling around the country and going and staying on all the beaches and in summer houses and so on so we had a really great upbringing very grateful for that certainly athletically based something from the field hockey field that you learned that you still employ I wonder what that might be um, the thing I, th- I remember the most was um, it is all about teamwork because in the end, no matter how good somebody is, they get injured. Um, nobody wants to pass the ball to them if they're too much of a glory hunter. And so <laughs> it was really all about teamwork. And so the strength of that team, um, the uh, having each other's back, I think is incredibly important and um, promoting the people who work with you um, and, you know, standing behind people when there is a problem. Yeah. Um, I think there are the qualities that I learned the most from, from that sort of, especially from the intense competitive periods, because that's what defines you as a team and that's where you will be strong and others won't. I wonder how you uh, came to grips with playing tennis, which is very singular. If you're an actual field hockey person, you identify most as a field hockey person from this conversation, I'm understanding. How are you able to be a tennis player? Well, tennis player, you also play doubles, and that's actually probably always been a little bit more um, fun for me rather than, you know, I've definitely played... Uh, you know, uh, but I would say it's it's been much more of a recreational fun thing, and mm. I think uh, you know it's it's a great game. You can take it anywhere in the world. It's a bit like you know being a good swimmer. You can jump into a pool anywhere in the world. You don't need to have a set of golf clubs. My husband, for example, is really into sailing, and in 2000 he sailed around the world in a in a competitive race. My goodness! Um, but that is so dependent on you know having a big yacht lots of sponsors team you know teams supported by brands to get them around the world so there's a lot of depend you know v- things that you are dependent on mm. whereas i always think if you're a runner a swimmer a tennis player you know th- th- they're easy things you can just pick them up and do them anywhere in the world mm-hmm. and i would put skiing in the same category i think you just need a half decent set of skis and you can get going so sure and a mountain some yeah, snow and a mountain. yeah, <laughs> yeah. When did you uh, take leave of uh, Ireland and where did you go? So um, I left Ireland in uh, 1999, I think. Yeah, 1999. um, And went to Paris. Mm -hmm. Um, I spent about two years in Paris. Lived on a houseboat on the Seine. And I worked for the Accor Group, which is, of course, the biggest hotel group in the world. And they own Europe Car. So I worked on their sort of online platforms there. But they couldn't find you a room? So they couldn't find me a room, so I, I lived on a houseboat, <laughs> consequently. And that was a lot of fun. We used to just unplug our electricity on a Sunday and take the boat down the Seine. And oh. we would have a bunch of friends and open some you know, wine and champagne at the back of the boat. Sure. We would take our holidays um, by just heading down to the Loire and picking up people and dropping them off on the way. Then we would fill the base of the boat with very good champagne and come back up again. Um, and then um, we moved to Brussels. Um, my husband had, was in the hospitality business and owned a number of pubs across Europe. Europe, a yeah. restaurant and bars and we moved to Brussels and then shortly afterwards he went sailing I went to live in London mm-hmm. where I stayed for about six years and then we moved to the Pacific Islands and yeah. did uh, Samoa first followed by Papua New Guinea then Vanuatu Fiji um, we lived in those countries and then also built networks in Tonga and Nauru which is incidentally the world's smallest um um, island nation, um, but it's an independent country. It's a it's a country, and that was uh, the first solution telecoms uh, telecommunication solution. We launched it there, which well, was really interesting. And, and so, thanks for doing it, because now when I want to retire to one of these islands, <laughs> we'll be there's all no set up. There's no getting away. I think, yeah, there's no getting away. Oh no, I'm just saying I'll be able to, you know, log into my Netflix. Oh yes. yeah, 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 or yeah whatever, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What what, uh, what would you suggest as far as uh, a, a place to go? Which which one of those was your favorite, if you have? one um i think they all have different i mean for me i I would say that fiji is our favorite Mm. we our two daughters were born in fiji Mm -hmm. um we um, adopted our daughters from fiji Mm -hmm. um just when they were born the day that they were born so Mm -hmm. we feel incredibly um lucky to have been there and that this journey brought us there and it's amazing how things um turn out and it's amazing how fate leads leads you where it's you know where you're supposed to be Mm -hmm. um and so i guess we have a real affinity with fiji we have a lot of really close friends there who we are still in contact with and we go down to fiji every two years we make a point of taking the girls down they're seven now Mm -hmm. there are six months between them um and we're really well 
um, embedded there, I feel. And, um, you know, that's something that we will hold dear always. And so I think for that reason, Fiji be my favorite. But I have to say that um, all of the experiences down there were amazing. Any one of them, you know, Vanuatu to Samoa, incredible people everywhere. We made great friends and uh, would, would happily go back to any of them any day. Mm. But your office is where for City? So our office is in Singapore, um, in Asia Square in Singapore, which mm-hmm. is you know pretty much the CBD. Um, and Singapore has also been an amazing chapter for entirely different reasons. Um, I think one of the things I wanted to do when I came back to Singapore was really kind of get stuck into the startup scene here because there's so much happening in terms of technology. Mm-hmm. So before I went to City, I worked with two different um, startups. One was a computer vision deep learning startup, which oh, wow. was really about... Um, if you like, the, 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 the consumer use case was that you can hold your phone up to anything mm-hmm. and um, it will return uh, thousands of results in the same way as today iterative search or typing something in text mm. into Google will. Mm-hmm. Well, the future is not going to be that. The future is just holding your phone up and scanning and it will link back to databases which have millions of images. And then you can shop that shirt that you're wearing or you can, you know, uh, shop hopefully the microphone because it's the best one I've ever seen. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Thanks so, for yeah. <laughs> And so I think, um, you know, there is a real, uh, and, and I think that, you know, Singapore has been fun, front and center in this region of driving that kind of, you know, technological advancement and change. Mm. Um, I also worked at a, um, a payment startup which was uh, moving money over social networks. So really interesting to get embedded again into deep into technology. W- would I know that company or? They're startups, so oh, you okay. probably know you okay. not necessarily. All right. What should we be paying attention to as far as deep learning is concerned if you have this experience, right? So I think that what's going to be really interesting is that everything around us is going to be is going to be catalogued. I mean, images everywhere are being catalogued as we speak mm-hmm. and everything will be fully searchable by just holding your phone up. And so I think that is something that will change everything because the depth you know, of information that you can find out very quickly without having to use words to describe it mm-hmm because it will just be catalogued against databases. Um, so I think that the, the future of deep learning in that regard is really interesting. Um, I think in terms of artificial intelligence, it's just completely is already changing how businesses operate, how they will operate in the future. Sure. Um, and really empowering people to do great work. So going deeper, understanding more, and providing ultimately better experiences because they're able to respond to customers in real time. You have the chatbot thing going. That's, of course, a little bit of AI, right? A little tiny bit. You made the tiny reference uh, with your fingers. How much more can you tell us about what City might be doing, what you might be doing at City in terms of AI? Well, I think that, you know, the City bot, the way it is today, um, we've launched it on Facebook Messenger. But going forward, as we go through this process, um, we will, of course, use much more capabilities of artificial intelligence to develop the bot. Mm-hmm. And that's the conversational banking piece. So as time goes on, we'll embed the learnings from customers so that we can teach the bot to do the things that the customers want it to do. So I feel like that's going to be a really immersive experience as we as we move forward. Um, and that's going to power a lot of things. So whether you're on WeChat and you want to talk to City or whether you're on um, Facebook Messenger will be wherever customers are. So I think that that level of intelligence that we can provide through using our AI platform will be something that will power a lot of better experiences for customers. And so I don't think when people worry about, you know, the future of artificial intelligence, I think that... You know, it's not, it's it, the, the design from a company perspective and certainly from what we're talking about is to enable customers to do more without having to, in a way that is convenient and suits them, as opposed to anybody really, you know, trying to get into your data and figure out, you know, what you're doing every minute of the day. It is really going to be used to help to deliver experiences and services and products that people want. Yeah, it's the... the what is the benefit in the former? Why, of course, it's going to be the latter. In, in other words, um, who has that kind of time? <laughs> well, I think you know it's a good question. There yeah, right? are there are people, and you know, who probably do. But I, I think that overall, no, I mean corporate, uh, yeah, global corporate, exactly. You know, no, exactly. I mean, I think that there is, you know, the uh, the overriding factor here is consumer convenience. Yeah. 
ease, simplicity and giving you things that are relevant and contextual to you and designed and tailored to you as opposed to because you, you know, you look like this and you have this income bracket, we're going to give you this offer. That's mm. a very uh, blunt tool of segmentation. And this will actually get us down to an audience of one to one where I can really know you as a customer and I can really figure out mm. how you want to interact with me. And then I can hopefully give you that. So that's the I think that that's the ethos of where this is going. You seem to be excited by this. Yes, I think it's um, I think it's an incredibly exciting area. And, you know, to be frank, I mean, the reason I joined banking is because I think that there has never been a, a more interesting time to work in financial services. Honestly, like five years ago, I wouldn't even have considered it. Now, I think it's actually an incredibly interesting time to be here because we can actually change it to being an experience that customers actually enjoy and find useful. You said we can change it. We are changing it. You I mean, have to change it, don't yeah, you? Yeah, we are, but we right. are changing as yeah. we go. I mean, it's not going to happen overnight, and there's a lot of things happening in that way, but I think the the, the paradigm shift has begun. I think people are, everybody, it's not just us, the industry is moving that way. Customers mm. are demanding it. Their mm. expectations are higher than ever, and you know what? We just see that now if customers have a bad experience, I think I read this in the Mary Meeker report, 80% of them will never come back again. Whereas, you know, maybe five years ago, that number was like 54, 55%. Now 80% of them, because the choice is massive. Yep. The possibilities are endless. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the experience front and center and core to everything you do, that gap in experience is going to be the thing that drives customers away from you and, and into the arms of another. So I think it's really important that we're very cognizant of that. You mentioned Mary Meeker, a key thinker of our time. Who else do you pay attention to as far as what they say and do? Oh, a lot of people, actually. <laughs> a lot of people, surprisingly. Who, who, who might come to, to the top of your mind? Um, I mean, I think for me, I, I read a lot. Um, I'll follow a lot of um, what um, Tesla does and says just because I think that they're a really interesting brand in terms of how they innovate. Um, definitely uh, all Amazon-related materials. Mm -hmm. um, Apple, these are the brands that I definitely follow. It's not necessarily individuals, although, of course, you know, you would tend to read the, what their founders and CEOs say. Sure. But it's actually also what the companies are doing and saying. Yeah. And so some of those brands that I fully believe are, they are only ever starting with the customer experience and the customer, they're the brands that I tend to find the most interesting because they always do things that completely shift and revolutionize industries. To that point, I just uh, had the occasion to, in New York City, on 34th Street, walk into the physical Amazon bookstore. Oh, wow. Do Amazing. you believe me? Uh, I know that it's there because I've seen photos. It's what is going on? Well, I think it's great, actually. I mean, I, you know, I think it's it's awesome because people sometimes want to touch and feel and look at books before they actually buy them. And if you're a believer, and I actually love that experience of picking up a magazine in particular right. and a newspaper sometimes, not every day, but at a weekend, I think it's quite a luxury to have you know, a newspaper in your hand, although I will get my news basically on mobile. I won't even read it on an iPad. I get all my news through my mobile device. Sure. Um, that's during the week when I'm on the go. But if I have time at the weekend, I think there is nothing nicer than... So I can totally understand where they're coming from, which is to let customers experience that mm -hmm. feeling of picking up a book, leafing through it, and then saying, do I want to buy that? I don't think it's that they've opened the store to drive massive profits i think it's a showcase for them to the world and i think probably actually it was sorely lacking mm -hmm. um yeah. previously and so i think it makes sense well, i asked a number of the agents that were working in the store you know what their backgrounds were and they were all readers of some kind that was a, a you know and they all had retail experience of course um not necessarily high level but uh, definitely not low-level retail experience, if that makes sense. Yes. And, you know, each one of them said, yeah, well, actually, it's because our customers have asked for it. They wanted to see, touch, and feel uh, the books. And then, of course, we're going to put the devices in here. So I went in with my 72-year-old dad who had no idea about any of the devices. And he said, oh, I didn't know any about any of these. <laughs> Maybe I'll get a few of them. <laughs> so uh, that, that was interesting, and that remains fascinating to me that – Almost in the same footprint, I would have gone into the Barnes & Noble store that has since yes. closed because of Amazon. Yes, ironic. Ironic. Such it, is life. It, it, yeah, it's, it is. It is. Uh, it's remarkable. Um, and then, of course, there is uh, the, the recent news of the Nordstrom store that won't have any 
merchandise, right? Yes. I mean, um, yeah, that's fairly extraordinary, <laughs> to say the least. Um, Do you see where they're going with it? Because I, 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 I could see you being tuned in with the Amazon store. Yeah. You... I, I haven't read much about the Nordstrom thing. I just uh. it flashed up yesterday. Right. Um, yeah. but yesterday, I, literally. Yesterday, yeah. it flashed up on my screen. I didn't actually. I just heard somebody talking about it earlier, but I haven't mm. really uh, you know, seen their opinion on it and what they're planning to go, where they're planning to go with it. But look, I think, hey, you know, it... If, it, if they have a strategy around it that is, um, I, I'd need to understand more about what it is that they're doing. But mm. I, if it's for the right reasons, if it's really about um, delivering a better experience, then I'm sure it'll work for them. And we mentioned yesterday, so we should say that we're at uh, CEM Asia. Yes. And uh, here in Singapore. And that was the news yesterday. Um, but the quote I think that I saw was, there is no online customer or offline customer. There's the customer. I agree with that fully. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Because, you know, we were talking about discovery. So, um, and this it applies to everybody. If I'm buying, if I want to buy something, I am... 99% likely to go on, have a look at what they have first, and then I will go into a store and I will try it on. Mm -hmm. Or I may just order it online and send it back. But the, for sure, I would like the idea of researching something online first before I actually make the trip to the store. And I don't want to waste three hours of my time if I could you know, not find it online or if it wasn't there, if I didn't like the texture or the look or the feel of um, you know, what I thought the fabric was going to be. So I think that there is a lot, it makes a lot of sense to do your initial research, then to go to the store. Mm -hmm. And whether that's click and buy, which I think is, you know, talking to a lot of the retail brands, increasingly more popular that people actually purchase online and then they just go to the store to pick it up. So I think that there's many, many different ways of doing this. But as a consumer, um, I like to have the choice. I do not like to be limited to one channel. Mm -hmm. I like to be able to interact with a brand however I want to. And, you know, um, I don't really want to be dictated to by the brand as to what my experience would be. I want them to service me wherever I want to be. Right. If I were to uh, ask Neve, the athlete, uh, as a student... I think athlete is probably a bit strong, but anyway. <laughs> well, just that that seemed to be the focus at the time. Yes, at the time. Yeah, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And that's my point. If yeah. I were to ask her uh, that, you know... Um, do you think that you'll be kind of this, uh, you know, customer experience person working for one of the biggest banks on earth? What would she have said? Um, I think, you know, I think customer experience is a, it's probably not something that, it's not a job that existed when I was growing up. No, it did um, not. I think the marketing piece, which is traditionally, you know, uh, that's where I've come from. I've come mm -hmm. from more of a marketing background. Yeah, I mean, that always, you know, from an early age, I always sort of saw that that was something I was interested in. Um, oh, you did? Yeah, mar the marketing piece, you know, coming into secondary school and understanding what the different, you know, op op opportunities were, whether that was around communications, marketing. So that was definitely something mm. um, I really enjoyed. Um, customer experience, no, because I, for me, this is kind of, you know, this is sort of a newer category of, sure. of things. But um, but the iteration from then, that the it iteration, was... The iteration, for me, that's just all embedded in understanding the customer. Certainly. And we've had to call it out as a thing, because obviously... Yeah. Um, and but, it was all the way back then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so the category is not uh, – banking, yeah, would be would have been a surprise to me <laughs> because right. it's just not an industry. Whereas technology and anything related, I've always been, you know, super interested in. So banking, now that it's becoming digital, I find it really interesting. And now that it's becoming customer-focused, that's why I'm interested um, the traditional banking industry, the way, you know, I'm probably, you know, I'm probably not the most likely person to end up doing that. No, <laughs> I'll agree with you based on my <laughs> limited understanding of you. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have more time to continue to talk, which I could do all day. So I'll ask you the three final questions. I'll tell you what they are, and then I'll ask you them in order. What has most surprised you at work? And we've noted that you've been literally all around the world. Uh, what's most surprised you in life? And on the soundtrack of your life, Neve, one track, one song that's got to be on there. But first things first. Okay, what has most surprised me in work? Do you mean work generally or work at City? What has most surprised you at work along the way? Oh, along the way. Yeah. Um, I think what has most surprised me is that it's in some ways it's easier than I thought it was going to be. And I don't mean that work is easy. I mean that... Generally speaking, if you approach things with an attitude that you are there because you want to be part of a team and you want to get things done, not too many people get in your way of getting things done. Um, so I have not 
I've been actually pleasantly surprised by hmm. that sort of lack of, you know, friction, friction yeah. which, um, you know, is, is possible and you hear about quite a bit, right? So mm-hmm. that's been one of the sort of most pleasant surprises along the way. Excellent. The other thing that surprises me is just how much things are the same, even between industries, right? Mm-hmm. Like when you compare different industries, there are certain things that no matter, <laughs> you know, there are certain characteristics that just remain and they're probably mainly to do with people I guess as opposed to the industry itself so yeah. I think they're they're two of the um of the, of the most important things um in terms of soundtrack I would say Oh no wait oh, we're skipping Before we're skipping straight along here what has most surprised you in life What has most surprised me in life um That's a really difficult question that's um might be the biggest question Yes um so one of them is um is is intensely personal which is that and uh, the thing that surprised me the most was uh losing my father very suddenly mm. uh when i was 26 years old and mm. it was very sudden and he was not he was not unwell in any way so that was a huge surprise in in the way that it <clears throat> impacted me for a couple of years i mm. really struggled to almost um function i would say and so yeah. um i found that to have a deep and emotionally profound impact on myself. And Absolutely. so that's something that I, um, and then, and then just quickly. Sorry. Yeah. I also, uh, lost my mother around the same time in my life. I was 30, but she was sick for three years. So there's, um, there was that. And then my buddy right around the same time, his father died in a car accident mm-hmm. suddenly. And we compared notes and, uh, both of them were terrible. So there's no, positive yeah like which one's better the, <laughs> no, no it's, it's there's no positive yeah. there right it happens right and you, and you move on and you live and you learn and whatever else and um, so that's if you like i guess in terms of the biggest surprise yeah. that was kind of the most impactful and, and the biggest surprise it would have to and um, the other greatest surprise was um having my two um children yes and uh, i guess uh understanding not ever believing you have to do it to believe it, the extreme joy mm. that, you know, very small children can bring and then even more as they grow to. Um, and I think that that's something that I almost wasn't even prepared for. And so that, you know, in a positive way was the most positive surprise. Are they um, athletes? Um, <laughs> yes, one of them. Well, actually, both of them are in different ways. One of them is a football player and she's oh. going to start playing hockey. And then the other one is a great gymnast and ballerina and swimmer. Great. So they have their own, you know, they have their own little talents. That's it. Um, and is your your husband back from his sailing expedition? Yeah, so he only went for a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, he's talking about doing another in a few years, but for now we've sort of put the kibosh on that. Indeed. Um, but yeah, no, he sails a lot and he still, you know, competes and stuff. Good. Um, so, um, and soundtrack. Then, okay, soundtrack. So I'm going to just pick one that um, is, I just, uh, I'm going to use the band The Cure. You know The Cure? Of course. So um, I think um, uh, Friday I'm in Love is I one was, of my favorites. I was going to guess that. Yeah. Once you said The Cure, I thought, is she going to? Yeah, she because did. I just, um, it always reminds me of that sort of really happy beginning of the weekend. Yeah. And then on a Monday, it can put you in a good mood because you just listen to that and it's Friday. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's probably a few a few different um, tracks that I could mention, but I'll just mention that one because uh, I really love it. I, that's a fantastic answer. How about that? Neve? this is an absolute pleasure. It is a wonder to meet another person who seems to be as intense as I am and can certainly speak as quickly <laughs> as I do. Okay. All right. Neve, appreciate it. Thank you, Seth. Thank you. And there you have Neve Fern. How do we address this from a customer perspective? Let's tap into passions. Let's tap into lifestyle. We're trying to remove one by one the pain points and the barriers. Very much appreciate Neve Byrne and her time. Very much appreciate you and your time. Stay tuned.